from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Ahead today, K-State's Joel DeRushi will talk about readying those livestock feeding facilities for the first widespread blast of cold winter weather expected to enter the state in the coming days. He'll look at, among other things, managing the ventilation in indoor facilities to avert cold weather livestock health issues, and he'll discuss cleaning and mounding those outdoor feeding areas to help minimize the winter chill. Also today, K-State's Mike Stom reports on the condition of canola stands currently, and he'll talk about new K-State canola research, which will be featured at the 2018 Canola College the university will sponsor in January. And standing by with another stop, look, and listen, K-State's Gus Vanderhoven, plus more here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Well, the weather is expected to change for the worse here as we move into the weekend. We haven't had full-blown winter weather to any great extent yet, but that may well be on its way. And for you livestock producers, have you made ready for those conditions for your animals? We'll talk about some things to get after soon. Joel DeRushi joining us once more, Livestock Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Of course, it's about keeping livestock in good comfort, but that also means keeping them in a good state of productivity, right, Joel? That's right, Eric. And as we look at uh, the typical winter weather and especially the temperature fluctuations, we recognize that some of the health, especially respiratory challenges that come with that. And as we appear to be will be our first good bout of cold weather for an extended period of time over the Christmas holiday, it's good to remember that we need to look at managing those animals appropriately during the, especially during these first cold spells when they haven't been acclimated to that type of weather previously. Let's break this out into two segments, one being those animals that will be housed indoors for the winter, for the large part anyway. And one of the things that you want producers to pay a particular bit of attention to is the ventilation of that facility. Right. The ventilation, and again, for this, you know, often pertains a lot to our swine and our poultry producers that have confinement buildings inside. But also we need to make sure we're thinking about some of our cattle facilities as well. For some of our producers that are starting to calve or just pulling animals inside, the same concepts apply. Where We want to make sure that indoor environment where the ventilation or how much air coming in as well as leaving is optimal. And what we, our goal with proper winter ventilation is to remove the moisture from inside that building as well as keep the the ammonia levels from the manure that accumulates inside pulled out as well. And it becomes very important, especially from a moisture standpoint, our tendency is to really shut up buildings and to slow the fans down during these times of cold weather, which does happen and is logical to keep the inside warmer. But we can't create an environment where we increase the humidity so much that it's going to adversely affect the respiratory system of those livestock. And in fact, by doing that, well, it actually can cause worse conditions than if that barn was cooled down and we're able in pulling the right amount of air. So we want to make sure that we maintain some minimum ventilation to keep fresh air in for those animals to really keep their respiratory system ideal because our goal while we have them inside is to provide that better environment and we need to make sure that we ensure that we do that for this type of animal. So when checking your ventilation, just go by your own casual observations as to whether or not that's adequate or too much ventilation? 
Yeah, so a lot of times uh, for those uh, barns that are complete confinement, certainly the, the controllers or everything is set up in most facilities on an electronic system where we can set the minimum temperature, the minimum ventilations for that time of year, and those get programmed in. But along with the, the computer program, you have to be able to use your common sense. If you walk in a building and the animals are being chilled, uh, we need to do something to adjust the ventilation. In particular, we, we will find this time of year, if we didn't perform correct maintenance of different areas of the barn and curtains or different doors, air that's leaking, we'll clearly see the areas where different animals will be chilled within a particular barn, and we need to react and, and get those uh, properly covered or properly fixed to make sure we're not chilling a subset of that population, even though the overall barn might be okay. And aligned with that, you say that one wants to strive for a consistency in that indoor temperature. Right. And one of the biggest challenges is, especially as we move from warmer days, like in the beginning of this week till over the Christmas period when it gets cold, the ventilation itself needs to be tweaked uh, to make sure that we're still not pulling too much air from the outside in. That is certainly a lot colder when we pull the same air that is when the highs are in the 50s and 60s. And so, again, just using good stockmanship, using some uh, past experiences with individual barns that have fans that control the ventilation in and out. But again, back to some of our calving barns, some of our barns that don't have ventilation in terms of fans, making sure that we have the doors cracked or opened appropriately to pull air in and out so we don't create an adverse environment for those animals. And stay right on top of that throughout the duration of the winter for those animals which will be largely housed outdoors. And let's stay with a feedlot scenario here, if we might, Joel. Cleanliness and dryness, those are the two watchwords, right? Absolutely. And when, when we talk about the outside, and for many of our producers, and whether you have five animals out in the feedlot or 50,000, the same principle applies. Mm -hmm. If we can keep those animals dry, and that's more of a challenge, obviously, if we get some outside moisture, some snow, some light rain, those animals will get very easily get chilled from having that wet condition. But where we can also counter that is still have areas where they can lay down. The biggest problem that we can run into is if we have wet animals and a muddy floor underneath them and they do not have an adequate place to lay down because those animals will stand for a long period of time or once they do lay down, that mud underneath them and is, is going to be very cold and they're going to get chilled very easily in those cases where they just get exhausted and have to lay down. So we, it, we do our best prior to uh, winter to have a box scraper to scrape the, the manure and any loose soil off so we have a nice, good, hard surface. We also need to be very careful when we clean that we keep that pen shaped so that extra moisture drains away. Uh, one of the biggest problems we can have in any sort of outside feedlot is pools of low spots where that water is going to accumulate, the mud's going to get deep, and frequently that can happen around the watering areas as well as the feeding areas. So making sure we have good surfaces that are well drained around them, and then we can allow those pens to dry out much quicker. When the more moisture we shed off the pen, everybody knows the faster that pen's going to dry, and we really need to be paying attention to that because in these prolonged cold snaps or longer moisture events that are cold, we just got to do the, what we can on that pen to keep it as dry as possible or to drain away. And as far as recommendations on bedding that could be added? Straw and corn stalks will generally be as commonly used for, for a, the bedding. Again, generally we'd like to do this on the mounds that were built. Um, and any cattle producer within their pens uh, should have some mounds, again, that are going to shed water where those animals can get up off of the normal lower plane of that feedlot. And then if we do some bedding, that's the appropriate place to do that so they have a dry area to uh, lay down. But again, straw, corn stalks, and, and providing a, an adequate amount, but not getting so crazy that all of a sudden we just create a big mess of them as well. And so we're better off to put out smaller amounts more frequently uh, than to try and overbed because those animals, that's where they're going to stand. And once those cattle stand up, one of the first things they do is they'll urinate and defecate, mm -hmm. and they'll continue to then get that bedding dirty. So instead of deep bedding one time, putting more bedding out at smaller amounts is more ideal. 
And then there's the winter wind, which can tear right into animals and cause severe chill issues, making sure that there's some windbreak available of some sort, either permanent or temporary, right? Windbreaks serve a very valuable purpose uh, to keep those animals warmer and shed that cold wind that tends to come uh, with this cold weather as well. And yes, so many facilities are set up. Obviously, shelter belts or tree lines uh, are extremely valuable, whether you're in a feedlot or whether you have cattle out on winter pasture uh, to provide some of that protection during the wind. Uh, Many producers will also use portable type of uh, wind deflection. Uh, there's many that are commercially purchased. Some producers make some themselves. Uh, we also can get into just simply stacking hay bales. Uh, very common for some producers to uh, get a double stack of uh, hay bales or whatever their forage source is, is around to provide some initial protection. Anything to break the sharpness of the wind is certainly an advantageous and reduces stress on those animals when they're already cold and maybe wet as well. Well, this is an assortment of ideas, Joel, that you share with producers. Point is, they uh, should be thinking about these things, taking whatever steps necessary now, as opposed to right in the thick of that winter storm blowing in, right? Right. And and with the cold weather coming, we're sitting here towards almost the end of December right now. Uh, There's a lot of winter time left. And so preparing now, and also it's a good reminder on the human side of things, uh, we haven't been exactly exposed to much cold weather either. So these first couple blasts are kind of a shock to our system as well. So making sure we're dressed appropriately. Also in in the pickups and the different vehicles where we're providing care to our livestock, rethinking about our flashlights. With the holidays, we're often feeding maybe later at night or different times when we're not in the family gathering times. We want to make sure we have the appropriate clothes and and, uh, flashlights in particular to make sure that we're in a safe environment for ourselves feeding livestock um, during this type of weather. Preparation on all counts, very much in order here. Joel, thanks and happy holidays to you. Merry Christmas, Eric. That's Joel DeRushi, Livestock Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Again, livestock producers, some things to ponder and even put into action here in the coming days ahead of that first true winter weather of the season in as far as preparing your facilities and your stock for that oncoming cold. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back in a moment on this, the K-State Radio Network. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and for the next segment, it's all about canola, the current stand that's in the ground right now, how well it's faring, and a preview of a special educational event that K-State Research and Extension will once again be sponsoring in early 2018 for canola growers. More on that shortly, but alongside once again is K-State canola breeder Mike Stom with a quick briefing on how canola is doing out there amidst what are less than ideal growing conditions at the moment. Mike, is the crop feeling the pressure right now? It certainly is, I would say. Uh, And like you mentioned, uh, drought right now is really the the talk, and it's all going to depend on what our winter and spring moisture looks like and how the crop pulls out. And so thinking about where we're sitting at today, we kind of got to look back to what our establishment conditions were like last fall. And the month of September was pretty dry and hot and windy at the beginning of the month, and so producers really were waiting for rain uh, to plant this year. And if you think about it, looking back at the previous two growing seasons, delayed planting wasn't a problem at all. We, Some of our best canola crop was the late planted crop. And so we weren't real worried about that at, at that point in time. But that delayed planting because we did get those rains eventually uh, the last 10 days of September. And so that pushed the majority of our crop into the early October uh, time frame of planting. And so the crop was planted late. 
then it was actually a, a cooler October and November than uh, we've had the previous two growing seasons. And so we didn't quite get the, the top growth that we wanted to going into the winter months. What does all that mean about the hardiness factor? That's always been something that has been watched carefully with canola, but uh, how do things stand in that regard now? Well, it's going to be touch and go in some fields for sure because uh, of the smaller canola. You know, typically we say we want 6 to 12 inches of top growth and 8 or 10 true leaves going into the winter dormancy period. And in some fields, we certainly haven't achieved that amount of growth yet. I feel pretty confident in the genetics that we have now uh, in terms of their ability to survive the winter, even at a smaller growth stage. Ideally, I'd like to see the more top growth. Uh, you know, the more top growth is certainly reflective of a more robust plant with a, a good root system established underneath of it. So the genetics and the top growth kind of work hand in hand, but then you got to think about our weather conditions too. And with the dry conditions and then this, you know, week or 10 days of cold weather that they're talking about, there's going to be some stress on the crop. But I would say the crop that is, has established and we have decent stands, you know, you can't count it out yet. It's real early in the ball game. And then with the confidence in the genetics that we have now, I think we're going to be all right in the majority of cases. It just kind of has to play out. Well, Mike, as canola is overwintering, it's a ripe opportunity for producers to sharpen their canola production and management skills via this canola college that K-State and Oklahoma State University put together, and that is set for mid-January. This is quite a comprehensive program each year. It is. There are uh, numerous presentations at Canola College, you know, ranging from the basics of production uh, to some of the latest uh, research uh, that's ongoing both at Kansas State and, and at Oklahoma State. Uh, we bring experienced producers in on one of the breakout sessions to talk about production practices that they've uh, been successful with. And it, it's certainly the educational event of the year, I would say, for the Southern Great Plains uh, for winter canola production. The particulars, it's set for January the 19th, a Friday, and the location will be in Oklahoma this year, Enid, to be exact, at the Chisholm Trail Expo Center. Now, you and a colleague here at K-State will be on the program, and as an example of what will be shared, Craig Rosabone agronomist at K-State, will be talking about the interactions of seeding rate, row spacing, and genetics, getting back to some of the things you've uncovered here in research at K-State. Right, Mike? That's right. I've been heavily involved with this study, and, and one of the things that's really interesting to me now is with the improvements that we have in genetics is how do these genetics perform in our current cropping systems? And those that are familiar with canola know that we can grow it in a, a variety of row spacings, anywhere from 7.5 inches all the way up to 30 inches. But when you change row spacings, you have to think about the seeding rate as well because as you widen that row spacing, you're crowding more seeds into that seed row if you're planting, say, at, at five pounds to the acre. So we're evaluating row spacings anywhere from you know about a pound to the acre all the way up to five pounds to the acre across differing row spacings using multiple varieties. Mm. Our findings are kind of interesting because we've over the years had this blanket seeding rate recommendation for Southern Great Plains producers. And from our research, what we've we've shown both in the narrow and the wide row spacing is that if you plant at an extremely low seeding rate, say 100,000 seeds per acre, or plant at a higher seeding rate, say at 500,000 seeds per acre, you're actually going to limit or you're going to reduce your yield somewhat. It's really at those intermediate seeding rates both in the narrow and the wide row spacings where we see the best yields of canola. So that's a little bit different than what we had thought over the last, you know, 10 to 20 years. A lower seeding rate is actually showing us better returns than what the higher seeding rate, the five pounds to the acre or 500,000 seeds per acre uh, seeding rates were showing us initially. So I think that's uh, something that's very interesting that we've we've been able to pull out of this study. It's very important economically speaking as one thinks about overall management. If you can get away with a lower seeding rate without hampering productivity, so much the better. Right. You can reduce your seeding rate somewhat and, and help with uh, seeding costs uh, of this crop. Mike, you will be directly talking about managing the canola harvest to maximize the yield, of course, but to maximize oil content as well. 
Yeah. When we talk about canola harvest, we talk about uh, ways to prep the crop for harvest. And one of those ways of prepping the crop is is swathing. And I've heard some talk of producers swathing too early. When you swath too early, you can certainly reduce your yield, but you also can reduce your oil content significantly. And now our crushing facility here in the, the Southern Great Plains has both oil discounts and oil premiums. And so if your oil contents are too low, you're going to get a discount on your oil when it's delivered uh, to the crush facility. And so proper management is going to help us maintain oil contents so that producers don't experience these discounts when they deliver their crop at the end of the, the harvest season. And so in our studies, we've done actually a couple of studies with swathing indirect cutting. One, just looking at the individual method at the optimum timing and seeing which method is going to produce the highest yield and the highest oil content. And from what we've shown over the the years that we've done this study, there's really no significant difference in yield between the two methods. So it, it kind of comes down to what your preference is on your own farm, whether or not you're going to swath and whether or whether or not you're going to direct cut. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both methods. Uh, we have seen a slight trend to higher oil contents when we direct cut, anywhere from you know half a percentage to a full percentage on oil content. In the second study, uh, we actually evaluated different timing of, of swathing operations. And so we swathed at green seed, uh, and then we swathed at the very end of the window when you might actually be causing some shatter losses in the crop and compared that to direct cutting. Because through my interactions with producers, I've you know heard of this trend of swathing earlier, and I, I really wanted to investigate what the effects were on oil content. And through our research, we've shown if you do swath early, say at when the seed is still green and there's no seed color change, you're dropping your oil contents by greater than three percentage points. And that's quite significant. You're also reducing yield by over 10 bushel to the acre. Just by moving to the optimal time for swathing, you're increasing oil content and you're also increasing yield. and Win-win uh, situation. It's, it's certainly a, a win-win situation. And even moving a little bit beyond that optimum time of swathing, you're increasing your oil content by approximately a percentage point uh, with really no ill effect on harvest loss through shattering mm. and still maintaining that yield potential. In this second study, we also showed that the direct cutting operation did provide the highest oil contents as well. So I know there are some some concerns about direct cutting because of the, the potential for shattering by leaving the crop out there later in the field. But if oil content is a big concern on, on a producer's farm, I think it's it's worthwhile considering the direct cutting approach. Well, if any of this has piqued the interest of our canola producers out there or somebody thinking about taking up canola as part of their crop rotation, it's just all the more reason why they should attend this Canola College coming up January the 19th, Mike. And there is much, much more to the program from Oklahoma State colleagues as well. How does one register for the event? Uh, they can go to canola.okstate.edu and register on the website. It's a free event, so we certainly encourage anyone who is interested to attend. And whether you're an experienced grower or someone who's brand new to canola, certainly encourage you to attend Canola College. And it is set for the 19th of January, which is a Friday. The location, once again, is the Chisholm Trail Expo Center in Enid, north central Oklahoma. Register now at canola.okstate.edu. Canola.okstate.edu. Mike, we appreciate your time as always. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Eric. Along with this canola breeder, Mike Stom, K-State Research and Extension, on this segment of Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services.
You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Thanks once again for listening. Over now to today's agricultural news page and these headlines, courtesy and part of DTN. Well, early, early this morning, the Senate did vote for that sweeping $1.5 trillion tax reform bill. The House had to re-vote on the measure today because Senate rules required the elimination of a few provisions from the bill that the House had approved earlier yesterday. A leading agricultural accounting firm notes that the bill would provide some benefits to producers, but pointed out that all the benefits, including the estate tax reform, will expire in about eight years. The bill does lower the corporate tax rate from 35% to 21% and includes several provisions such as an immediate business expensing and expanded Section 179 deductions, all meant to stimulate business growth and higher incomes. Now, producers who receive income from pass-through entities will see a 20% reduction. The effective impact of a 37% tax rate and a 20% deduction for pass-through income would set a top tax rate on business income at 29.6%. House Agriculture Committee Chairman Mike Conaway of Texas praised the vote, saying that he's pleased that House Ways and Means Committee Chairman Kevin Brady and his team produced a bill that, as he put it, acknowledges the unique tax challenges faced by those in agriculture, from lower marginal rates to the treatment of pass-through income to improved small business expensing. This bill delivers for farmers, ranchers, and all rural America, in Conaway's words. Now, that major Kansas-based accounting firm, Keiko Isom, said in the news release this week that farmers may need to restructure their operations in order to get maximum benefit from the new law, but noted that rate reductions and estate tax changes are beneficial to agriculture, however temporary. The core of this bill, the 21% flat rate for C corporations, according to Doug Clawson, a principal and certified public accountant with Keiko Isom, he said that most farm businesses are not strong structured as C-Corps and won't benefit from that rate unless they restructure. For farms that are structured as C-Corps, those in the 15% tax bracket would actually see a tax increase from the flat rate. The majority of farmers, however, he notes, are sole proprietors or structured as pass-through entities. These producers, he says, should see some benefits from the deduction for business and pass-through income, immediate expensing of capital purchases, and to some degree from reductions in in individual rates. Ahead of a scheduled meeting with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer, Senator Charles Grassley of Iowa yesterday told agricultural journalists there may be indications a renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement isn't going so well. Grassley said he had discussions with someone in the bureaucracy, as he put it, about possible contingencies if the U.S. backs out of NAFTA. Chief among the concerns for producers, what happens to commodity prices if renegotiations fall through? Grassley said there is some talk among federal agencies about putting together, as he put it, a pot of money as a commodity price support if the U.S. pulls out of NAFTA. He says that farmers don't want money from the federal treasury. They want it from the marketplace. Five rounds of negotiations have taken place so far. Grassley says there continue to be many outstanding issues related to agriculture. U.S. dairy producers continue to be concerned about Canada's trade practices, have been pressing for changes there, and agriculture groups have been calling for President Trump's administration to do no harm in renegotiating NAFTA. Now, back in November... A group of 168 farm groups and companies sent letters to all 50 governors asking them to defend NAFTA. Concern has been growing that the administration would withdraw altogether from the agreement. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue told reporters in Washington in November that the USDA was, in fact, making plans in case the USDA backs out of NAFTA. In writing to the governors, the 168 businesses and farm groups asked them to urge the president to support modernizing NAFTA, but that with the withdrawal would have adverse effects. That letter said that agriculture and food industry supports more than 22 million jobs and accounts for 20 percent of the U.S. economy and that uh, the NAFTA withdrawal would have a dramatic impact. The suggestion by a study from Impact Econ estimated that withdrawal from NAFTA would cost $13 billion in economic losses to agriculture. 
A change in the way the USDA determines what cattle are eligible for quality grading is expected to be more adequately compensating for the owners of finished steers and heifers. Todd Domer tells us here that allowing alternative options for determining the age of cattle will put more money in producers' pockets. The USDA Ag Marketing Service recently announced dentition and documentation of actual age will now be used as additional methods for classifying the maturity of carcasses. Dentition is a method for measuring the age of cattle based on their teeth. Estimates are more than 95% of U.S. fed steers and heifers are less than 30 months old based on dentition assessments at slaughter. Prior to the change, Dental age was not considered when USDA quality grades were assigned. Due to premature skeletal ossification, as many as 7.2% of carcasses produced by fed steers and heifers were classified as B maturity or older, a significant portion of these cattle were known to be less than 30 months of age, but the carcasses were classified as B maturity or greater based on physiological indicators and therefore significantly discounted and undervalued. A beef industry working group formed in 2014 and composed of representatives from the cow-calf, feeder, and packer segments conservatively estimated incorrect classification of carcasses costs the industry nearly $60 million annually. Carcasses incorrectly classified were sold at an estimated discount of nearly $275 per head. Taking into account the most recent research, dentition is a better indicator of chronological age than skeletal ossification. The same studies, funded by the Beef Checkoff, show beef product quality is not compromised when using the dentition method to assign carcass age. Allowing dentition or documentation of actual age will ensure more carcasses are eligible for USDA quality grades and allow producers to maximize the value of each animal. I'm Todd Domer. And lastly, in the headlines today, a Nebraska commission that approved a route for the Keystone XL pipeline through the state is declining requests to amend its decision. The Nebraska Public Service Commission yesterday denied motions by pipeline developer TransCanada and leading opponents of the project. The decision to approve the route through the state is expected to be appealed in court. Those uh, say that the alternative pathway will affect landowners who weren't along the company's preferred route and didn't have a chance to speak against it. We'll return shortly with more. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Have you ever thought about where your food comes from? If you're thinking the grocery store, think again. Facts show that the American farmer feeds more than 129 people. They are continually increasing and improving their operations. A wide variety of crops and livestock are grown in Kansas as well as the United States providing food to your dinner plate. Next time you see a farmer or rancher, thank them. For more information, contact K-State Research and Extension. This is Agriculture Today. Stop, look, and listen. This is our state, Kansas. If you partly closed your eyes... The lights become twinkling stars. That's Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with comment on life in rural Kansas. There's nothing new at Christmas, but we do celebrate again and again. It is the old we remember with the new thrown in. It is as if we purposefully, meaningfully want to stop all the turning momentarily to reflect. My youngest daughter wanted a real Christmas tree this year. Not a small two-footer. No, a real tree which would reach up to the ceiling. Her husband set it up and she started to decorate. The 600 lights were gracefully draped around and through the tree. But then she started to sneeze and wheeze. She finished the task at hand and then realized her sneezing did not get any better. She wondered if it might be the tree treated with chemicals to stay fresh. She googled and found out, yes, that was a possibility. She made a quick decision and hauled the tree outside with all the lights. 
Google gave some recommendations to treat the tree for allergies. The next day, she washed the tree and sprayed it with Clorox mix. So much for the sacred pine tree scent wafting through the house. She let it stand outside. I suggested she leave this tree outside all the time, finish decorating outside and placing it on the deck or lawn. Of course, some decorative items might not take to the wet weather, but the lights would shine, and if you partly closed your eyes, the lights would become twinkling stars. We all have done that when we were children. I've done it, still do it and lights sent their long rays out, trying to reach you. Squeezing your eyes more or less makes the candlelights come closer or stay farther away. I've not yet heard the end of the story, so I do not know if the tree was brought back into the house. I offered her a beautiful cedar from the farm, trimmed into the Christmas tree shape by an expert, her papa. But the eight-hour drive to and eight hours back from Denver made that a no-no when time starts to become premium this time of the year. Only five more days. Over the last few weeks, the old pewter plate has been overflowing with this year's Christmas cards. We had to get a basket. We read them and are reminded to remember so-and-so. Emails you can send at the last moment. Snail mail is a different thing. It sometimes takes a week for a letter or package to be delivered. I sympathize with our mailwoman who delivers our mail. She's cheerful and capable. She swings her small square truck up the long driveway and delivers. This year she brought a Christmas card from friends who overwinter in Florida. The card with Christmas wishes had written inside in perfect Dutch. Prettige kerstdagen en een gelukkig nieuwjaar voor u en uw gezin. This love, signed. Notice, this love. The card threw me off because of the perfect Dutch good wishes. Of course, it is because of the computer you can Google and type in and check and translate it in any language you choose. It's easy, very thoughtful. I chuckled when I read it again and saw who had done it. With computer capabilities, people now turn out very personalized cards. They show family additions, including babies, from our house to your house, from home to home, with love. Right above my computer has stood a very special Christmas card with a perfect Dutch winter scene. I treasure it as it is special. I received it unexpectedly in 2015 from an antique dealer in a small town of Diepenheim. I had bought there an English landscape painting with a famous horse and three young men discussing the horse's good points. It all took place under a big tree. It now hangs in the guest house of my son, Martin, and Daniela in Pinehurst, Texas. That Christmas, the mailman dropped the card in a mailbox signed by Paul and his wife, wishing us prettige kerstdagen en een gelukkig nieuwjaar. The scene is on the card. A Dutch scene, it is three-dimensional and has depth. When held properly, you can see a long way down a frozen canal with skaters skating and falling. Old Dutch houses, a church, and a farm, buildings in the snowy distance. A temporary coffee or hot chocolate stand along the side of the frozen canal to provide hot drinks to stay warm. In the foreground, a beautiful carved sled pulled by a team of dappled gray horses. The horses are decorated with bells, and they have the tips on their shoes so they do not slip on the ice and trot with confidence. In the sled, a warmly dressed woman and daughter covered by a colorful blanket, and behind their seat, the driver with tall head and scarf holding the reins. It's all very festive, especially with the cheerfully wrapped packages in front of the sled, neatly stacked. 
The bright red slat with shiny copper metalwork slides along on the smooth canal ice. I know they move fast because next to the slat a small dog runs happily along, tongue flapping. It's a beautiful scene, a winter scene, a Christmas scene. It was drawn by the famous illustrator Anton Pieck. What makes it so special is the perception of depth and all that is drawn into it, touching on the holiday season. The happiness, the sharing, the visiting, the expectations, the promise, the hope. To all of you, prettige kerstdagen en een gelukkig nieuwjaar. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Let the big bells ring. Gus Vanderhoven of Kansas State University with his weekly commentary on rural Kansas. Our time's away for today. As always, thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.